This is the video on the 2012 annual letter from Bill Gates, and he writes this letter each year for his foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this letter can be found in PDF format at this URL, and it's it's on the foundation's website. And I really encourage you to go to this URL to and, and read the PDF either before or after watching this video. And this is one of two videos, so look for the second video. So this is actually his fourth annual letter, the first he wrote in 2009. So here's an outline of his letter. He starts with an introduction, then goes into innovation in agriculture, then talks about global health, then discusses vaccines, polio, AIDS and the global fund, family planning, then he talks about U.S. education, and then he concludes with foundation updates and the giving pledge and why he's optimistic. So let's start with the introduction. So a recurring theme in his annual letter is innovation is the key to improving the world. He says, when innovators work on urgent problems and deliver solutions to people in need, the results can be magical. So currently, over 1 billion people, 15% of the world's population, live in extreme poverty. 50 years ago, 40% of the globe was poor. Then in the 1960s and 1970s, the Green Revolution happened. And this is when Norman Borlaug and others created seeds that gave higher yields. So he says the argument of his 2012 letter is to make the choice to keep investing in global development and global health to help the extreme poor build self-sufficiency. So let's talk about innovation in agriculture. Bill said that his foundation devoted $2 billion to help poor farm families become more productive. He gives an example of Christina, a farmer in Tanzania, who farms cassava, which is turned into tapioca. He says her crop has been invaded by two cassava diseases. This devastation of her crop is contributing to her poverty and it is affecting her children's ability to lead healthy, productive lives. So remember Christina because she's um, brought up later in the letter. But now Bill talks about some statistics. He said food prices are on the rise. From 1960 to 1985, food prices declined. 85 to 2000, they were stagnant. In 2000 to 2010, food prices are on the rise. Here's a nice chart of that from the World Bank. So decline, stagnancy, and rise. Another fact he talks about is the proportion of farmers in rich countries is declining. It says in the late 1800s in the U.S., over 50% of people worked in agriculture. Now less than 2% of people work in farming. In developing countries, the proportion is still high. In Brazil, 20% are in farming, India, 56%, and Uganda, 75%. Here's a nice chart of that. Shows the steep decline in the US. Then Uganda today is still 75%, India, 56%, and Brazil, 21%. So Bill talks about, in 1968, a popular book called The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich was published, and it predicted that hundreds of millions of people will certainly starve to death from the inability to feed the world's population. Fortunately, because of the Green Revolution, that dire prediction was wrong. But the success of the Green Revolution led to complacency, and agriculture aid from rich countries fell from 17% in 1987 to 4% in 2006. So Bill says, in the past 10 years, food demand has increased as people get richer. As people get richer, they eat more meat, and this raises demand for grain. However, the supply growth has not kept pace, and this has led to cost increase. Global warming is also not helping. It's predicted that the rise in global temperatures could reduce the productivity of main crops by 25%. Entire seasons of crops can be wiped out by droughts and floods. So Bill says, similar to Paul Ehrlich's alarms in his book, people are now wondering if global food production can support the world's population as it grows to 9.7 billion by 2050. But Bill is optimistic. He believes these predictions can also be proved wrong by prioritizing agricultural innovation. 
So he talks about some of that agricultural innovation through agricultural research. He says, agriculture is so important to human welfare and national stability, yet only three billion is spent each year on researching the seven most important crops. 1.5 billion comes from countries, 1.2 billion comes from private companies, and 300 million comes from CGIAR. He says, CGIAR is critical because they focus on the needs of poor countries. So some more stats. Bill says the poor spend a high percentage of their income on food. In the U.S., household expenditure is $32,051. 6% of this is spent on food. In Kenya, the average household expenditure is $541. 45% of this is spent on food. Here's a nice chart of that. You can see 32000 in the U.S., 6% is spent on food, $541 household expenditure in Kenya, 45% spent on food. So drastic difference between rich and poor countries. So Bill talks about how plants like humans are attacked by viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And farmers tend to use seeds that produce the highest yields, which unfortunately this creates a lack of crop diversity which is needed to fight these infections. So this lack of diversity means an infection can rapidly spread. He gives two historical examples of this happening. One is the potato blight that spread in Europe in the 1840s. And the second is the corn leaf blight in the US in the 1970s. Bill talks about how Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution and a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 1970, he moved to Mexico to create fungus-resistant varieties of wheat. In 1999, a new virulent variety of wheat fungus called UG99 was found in Uganda, and it has spread from in Africa and moved into Iran, Yemen, and it's on its way towards India. So currently, a large research effort is trying to prevent UG99 from spreading to Asia or the Americas. Bill says also research needs to be done on how crops can survive through the high temperatures, floods, and droughts we will likely see with global warming. Bill said he met with farmers in India using a new rice seed called Swarma Sub-1. This new seed is productive, it gives good yield, and it can survive in flooded fields. Bill says good is being done by private agricultural companies donating their assets and expertise to poor farmers. Countries like Brazil and China are offering their resources and deep experience. Brazil is a leader in soybeans, cassava, and tropical soils. And China is a leader in rice and farmer education. He said he and Melinda made arrangements to work with both countries. Their foundation did. So now Bill talks about five important African crops. The first is cassava, which is a starchy root turned into flour, and the starch extract is used to make tapioca. Second is corn, a cereal crop. Third is millet, a group of grains. Fourth is sorghum, a coarse cereal. And the fifth is yam, a starchy tuber, not sweet potatoes, which are called yams in North America. So these five are important African crops. Then he talks about how plant genetics is an important revolution that's currently taking place. Plant genetics actually draws from tools created to help cure human disease. And the efficiency of finding beneficial varieties of plants has been greatly increased by plant genetics. So now different varieties can be quickly found and bred together to create a hybrid plant with desirable characteristics. Bill talks about an innovative plant scientist, Dr. Joseph, in Tanzania, and he's leading a project to help fight the disease attacking Christina's cassava crops to help bring her out of poverty. So Dr. Joseph is a tangible example of how innovation can address the needs of local farmers and why innovation is key to improving the world. So now Bill talks about global health. He said most of the foundation's resources actually go to global health. He said the guiding principle is the same as in agriculture. Innovation is the means, equity is the end goal. He said more than 10 years ago, he and Melinda were inspired by a certain conviction. 
This conviction is all lives have equal value. So as a result, one of the first things they invested in was vaccines. In 2010, Bill and Melinda called on the global health community to make 2010 through 2020 the decade of vaccines. So Bill now talks about the Gavi Alliance, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. It's a public-private global health partnership. It helps poor countries introduce new life-saving vaccines. And he set a goal, they set a goal to raise $3.7 billion, and they actually received $4.3 billion in pledges on June 13, 2011. And he says he and Melinda were very humbled on this date. So now with this money, the poorest infants will receive the same vaccines that infants in rich countries receive. This money supports two new vaccines, Rotavirus for diarrhea and pneumococcus for pneumonia. By late 2015, 190,000 diarrheal deaths and 480,000 respiratory deaths will be prevented. So in total, this money will save 4 million lives. said on June 13, 2011, the Gavi Pledging Conference, that this date was a historic day for global health equity. So now Bill talks about vaccines. He says there's still many years before diarrhea and pneumonia vaccines are in every country. He said global coverage of basic childhood vaccines is currently at 80%. So the high-level political focus needs to be brought to this issue. This high-level focus was brought in 1970 when coverage grew from 20% to 80%. In May 2011, at the World Health Assembly, Bill announced the Gates Vaccine Innovation Award. The first award went to Dr. Hussain in Bangladesh. So Dr. Hussain, in 2009, he was assigned to two districts with 67% and 60% immunization rates. In 2010, one year later, he increased these rates to 85% and 79%. Bill said Dr. Hussain made these improvements by his innovative approach. What he did, uh, pregnant women were registered with co contact information and he made vaccinators more accountable. So now Bill talks about polio. He said the foundation's top priority is to help eradicate polio. He said at the beginning of 2011, polio virus was still spreading in three countries. This is African countries, in three areas, sorry. The second is Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the third is India said in India, there was only one case in 2011, on January 13th, in West Bengal. said this was an unbelievable challenge, but the Indian government deserves special credit for this achievement. Bill said the biggest focus in 2012 is improving the vaccination campaigns in Chad, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Bill said he met with leaders in Chad and Nigeria, and he's confident there is high-level political support. He said the biggest problem in Nigeria is low-quality campaigns, and some parents don't trust that vaccination is safe. In Pakistan, the security situation compounds problems. The challenge is continue to raise the $1 billion per year it takes to run the global polio campaign. In 2011, substantial contributions came from the following. The U.S., U.K., Australia, Japan, Canada, Norway, Saudi Arabia, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, and Rotary International. Bill says Rotary plays a pivotal role by directly supporting the program and encouraging other donors to give more. He also said FC Barcelona, a football club, is spreading these messages of polio eradication to millions of football fans across the globe. Bill says still enormous challenges remain, but success in India and 90 other countries gives Bill great confidence for eventual success.